condition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And I've been focusing in on philosophy. Philosophy isn't talking about Greek philosophers. It's just talking about a way of thinking. Satan comes and steals from us because of the way we think. And we need to have a Christian way of thinking. And sad to say, none of us were born Christians. Some of you may think you were, but no, that God doesn't have any grandchildren. You didn't have, you didn't inherit it by birth. You have to have your own personal relationship. And every one of us have learned things and have been taught things by our parents, by our society that were not biblical attitudes. And the way you think determines the way your life goes. And so I've been talking about how important this is. Then we turned over to Genesis chapter three and showed you that this is how Satan came against Adam and Eve. He had to come not with a fierce animal or a strong animal, but with the most subtle animal because he had no power to make Adam and Eve sin against God. He had to deceive them. He had to speak lies to them and get them to cooperate with him through thinking the way that he was trying to get them to think. Man, that is huge what I've just said right here. The very first thing he did was to attack God's word and said, hath God really said? And then he pointed their attention towards the negative. The one negative in all of the universe that they had, that they couldn't eat of a tree. He focused on that instead of all of the great things that God had done. If you were focused on God and just constantly living a life of thanksgiving towards God, it wouldn't bother you so much, all of the stuff that happens. If we were focused on God and, and all of his promises about heaven and how that in heaven, it's going to be so glorious that all of the problems we have in this life don't even, they aren't even worthy to be compared to the glory that we have. If that's all you thought about, then whatever life throws at you compared to that is insignificant and you'd be able to just deal with it. It wouldn't be a problem. But we make the same mistake that Eve did and that is we focus on what we don't have instead of what we do have. And anyway, this is what I've been teaching on and... Um, <clears throat> Anyway, it'll, it'll be a blessing to you. Let's turn back over to the book of Genesis. And let me share with you from Genesis chapter 1, one of the most important things that God has taught me. And this is a paradigm, a philosophy, a worldview. And since the Lord has shown me these things, it has radically changed the way that I think about things. I could teach on dozens of things that I believe are important, but this is one of the most important right here. And I just want you to look at this verse in Genesis chapter 1. And in verse 29, this is after he'd created the heavens and the earth, all of the trees, the vegetation, the animals, and Adam and Eve. It says in Genesis 1:29, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed, which is upon the face of all of the earth and every tree in the which is a fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat and it was so and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. You know, those are powerful verses. Some of you at first may just look at this and think, well, it's just information. What does it mean? I want you to go back to the 29th verse. And he says, behold, that means look. And he says, I have given you every herb bearing seed and every tree and all of these things for me. And here's the point that I'm wanting to get across. God didn't create Adam and Eve. And then after they were created, they got hungry and God, and they said, God, I'm hungry. And he said, oh, well, let me provide for you. God told them the moment that they were created, I have already provided everything that you'll need. He didn't wait until they got hungry and then created something for them. He anticipated their needs and he created all of the fruit bearing trees that are on this earth. Did you know I'm convinced that Adam and Eve had enough food on this earth to feed what we now have over 7 billion people. God hadn't created new stuff. He created all of this. The earth was abundant. 
There was enough food. You know, he didn't wait until they needed to breathe and say, well, let me create oxygen for you. He anticipated that we would need oxygen. He created us this way and he created all of the oxygen. He has never created more oxygen on this planet. And there's now 7 billion people that are breathing in and God has anticipated this. If we get to where we have 20 mil billion people, God has already anticipated whatever the earth is going to do and God created everything and it was complete and he hasn't created anything since then. I read a thing in a magazine on an airplane one time and they said that there's a stand of trees in Iceland that that stand of trees by itself could purge the entire carbon dioxide that the whole human race that the earth puts out and turn it back into oxygen, that one stand of trees. Did you know in the United States, we now have over twice as many trees in the United States as we had when the colonies first started? I had a friend in the Forest Service that says that. God has created this world that we are not in this fragile environment and I'm just going to say something real quick and then I'm going to leave this because I know some of you won't agree with this. But I do not believe with the tree hug. I do not agree with the tree huggers that we're destroying the earth. First of all, that's attributing to people more power and authority than we have. And it's a slam against God that God didn't anticipate what the human race was going to do and that this earth is fragile and all of these kind of things. It's not true. I don't know how many of you remember the commercials from the 1960s, one of them was a famous one, an Indian, uh, you know, uh, in a canoe paddling through a, a river that was dead fish floating and debris on it and just pollution everywhere. And then the Indian turns his eye and looks and there's just one tear coming out of his eye. I've read that that's probably one of the most effective ads that was ever created. And it was about pollution. And they said that it's going to take a hundred years to clean up the streams. And so anyway, they quit polluting some things. And did you know that in a year or two, it was amazing how the, the rivers and the streams purified themselves. They said that when Mount St. Helens blew up, that it was going to take a thousand years. And they were shocked that within 10 years, it had already progressed over what they were predicting would be tens of thousands of years. The earth is not fragile. God anticipated everything that people would do, everything, every need that we would ever have. If we run out of oil, which we haven't run out of oil, I've heard that if you were to use the shale oil that's in the United States, it could power all of our needs for over a hundred years. Not only ours, but the needs of the entire world. There's enough oil in this country to do it. But if you uh, don't like oil or we run out of oil. I've got a guy on staff who's made an engine that runs off of water. I read about a guy who made an engine and he drove a car over 100,000 miles that the only thing it used was water. There is, God has anticipated whatever our needs are and it's already provided. Now we might have to use our head for something besides a hat rack and figure out how to do it. But God has anticipated whatever the needs of this earth are. He didn't wait until we were hungry to create food. He didn't wait until we needed to breathe to create oxygen. He's anticipated the needs of the entire human race and he provided everything before we were even created. I haven't got time to go into this. I'll just mention it, but you think about this that man was created on the sixth day. And every one of these things says the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. If you really study this, the Jews count time, not from midnight to midnight, but they count it from sundown till sundown. And that's the way that the Jews still reckon a day. When we were in Israel, the Sabbath starts on Friday night and goes until Saturday night. And this is reflected right here. And so my point in saying that is on the sixth day, God created all of the animals and then he created man. And so there was a number of things that took place. And this means that man was created at the very end of his creation. And it says right here in verse 31 that the evening and the morning were the sixth day. And then chapter two, verse one Thus the heavens and the earth were finished 
and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had made. God quit right after man was born. He waited until everything was complete for man. Did you realize that there wasn't ground until the third day of creation? If God would have created us first, although we're the crowning jewel of God's creation, and he says that all of these things were created for us, if he would have created us first, we'd have had to tread water for three days. <laughs> there wasn't a sun and a moon and stars until the fourth day. There wasn't heat. It wasn't ready for us. If he would have created us on the fifth day, the fourth day, the fifth day, trees and mountains and hills and things would have been popping up and they didn't come from seeds. The original creation, they were fully grown and we'd have been having to dodge all of these things. It wasn't ready for us yet. God waited and we were the last thing, not because we're last, we're actually first but it's because God provided everything we would ever need so that when we were created, immediately we just entered into this rest where it's already done. Father, I'm hungry. And he says, oh, look at all of these trees. You can eat any of them. He had already provided it. I need to breathe. He says, just breathe. He had already done everything. And did you know that what I'm describing right now in the physical is also true in the spiritual. And this is something that has become a philosophy to me, a way of thinking that if you get this, it will radically, radically affect your life. That God, when you got born again, the only time God has ever created anything since the original creation was when you got born again. If you were born again, you are a new creation. You have been changed. But did you know that the Lord has never created more cattle? He doesn't get up in the morning and say, let there be a million new cows to replace all the one. He doesn't say, let there be a million new trees. Let there be this. And he has never created anything. It said he rested. And when it says he rested, it's not because God was worn out. It's not like if I create one more moon, I'm going to pass out. I have had it. No, God, he's not tired. He rested like an artist looks at his picture and it's so perfect that if he adds one more brush stroke to it, he's going to ruin it. Or like a lawyer who says, I rest my case. That doesn't mean that he's so tired he's got to rest because he's been arguing before the court. No, it means he's through. It's complete. When God rested, it was because it was complete. There was nothing left to do. He doesn't create new animals. God doesn't create new people. This will violate some people's religious stuff because they think that, you know, each one of us are a unique creation. God started the original creation and gave you the ability to procreate. Now, God is involved. You can take Psalms 139 and many others that show that you were formed in your mother's womb by God and he knew everything about you before you were even born. So I'm not saying that we are an accident or we just abs uh, accidentally happened, but you aren't a unique new creation. Your parents were given the ability to procreate and they created you. It's God. It's just like a seed. That seed has everything in it, but you have to plant it in the ground. There's some things that have to be done to release that power that's in that seed, but it's still the original creation. God hadn't created new seeds. He hadn't created new people. There are some people that think, well, we won't have children if God doesn't want us to. That's not true. If that's the way it was, prostitutes would never have children. People would never have children that they're going to abort them. God doesn't just look down and boom, instantly give you a child. This is why some people who believe that, well, if God wants us to have children, we'll have children. And if he doesn't, we won't. And they have 20 kids. Because God gave you authority. And if you put the laws into motion, it's going to work. Amen. So anyway, God rested. He's not created anything new. The only new thing that God has done is when Jesus was raised from the dead and we put faith in him, you become a new creation. 
It's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You are a new creation. And just like the first creation, God has anticipated. Boy, listen to what I'm saying. If you could get this, it would just change your life. God has anticipated anything you will ever, ever need. You do not need God to respond to you and give you something. When the doctor says you're going to die, it didn't catch God by surprise. God doesn't have to do something. Oh God, come and touch me. The scripture says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who is on self bear our sins and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed, were healed not are going to be healed. You've already been healed. Thank you for that one amen. amen. See what I'm doing? I'm beginning to come against your philosophy. You're th no, I'm not healed, right? Here's a doctor's report proving I'm sick. That can, a doctors can only check your physical body. They can't check your spirit realm. And in the spirit, it says, let me just read this to you. Some of you aren't going to believe this. Over in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is praying a prayer. And man, if you study the book of Ephesians, this is radically different. Once you get this paradigm, once you get this philosophy, once you understand what I'm saying, the book of Ephesians will transform your life if you understand it. Because verse 3 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath Past tense, blessed us with all spiritual blessings. The average person reads that and thinks, well, I'm not blessed. But it says you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's talking about in the spirit realm. God didn't put his power, his anointing, his blessings in your flesh, in your physical body, or in your soulish realm. Because if he had, Satan has access to those realms. He can steal it from you. But when you got born again, Ephesians 1.13 says you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. You were vacuum packed. And in that spirit is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. You've got raising from the dead power and it's in the spiritual realm and Satan can't touch it. It's really great wisdom that God created us the way that we are. This body's not changed yet. My mind's not totally changed yet, but my spirit is perfect. It is identical to Jesus. It's got all of his life and all of his power in it. And he has already given me everything I need. If I need healing, I don't need to say, oh God, stretch forth your hand and come heal me. See, this is what the average Christian does. In my prayer lines, I have had thousands of people come to me and they tell me about their situation and they tell me every gory detail and the purpose of it is to let me know how pitiful they are. And they, I, the doctors have given me up to die. I've got this. And they're trying to get my sympathy so that somehow or another I'll release the power of God and help them. And they come amplifying what they don't have instead of what they do have. I have yet to have a person come to me and say, I'm healed. I know I'm healed. It's done. I've got this resurrection power on the inside of me. And then just fall apart and tell me about how bad it is. Once you understand and amplify what God has done for you, it shrinks your problem down to where it's not a big deal. It's just like, I've got the power of God in me. The doctor says I'm dying. Just agree because it's a done deal. That's the way that you should be approaching this. But see, in your spirit, you've already got it. And here is Paul praying a prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse uh, 15. He says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And then he begins to tell you what he's praying. In verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He's not praying that God would do something special. You know, if I was to ask you right now that 2,000 years from now, people are going to be reading the prayer that you read, uh, pray for them. I want you to write out a prayer. In 2,000 years from now, they're going to read this prayer. How would you pray? Well, I've been around a lot of people 
and heard a lot of people pray. And I can guarantee you the average Christian would pray something like, oh God, just pour out your spirit. God, do a new thing. Oh God, send revival. Oh God, touch them. It would be all something about God, you do this. You know what Paul's praying? Lord, show them what they've got. That's a totally different approach. And he's praying, give revelation of what they've got. And then in verse 18, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened that they may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, not the glory of God in heaven. Right now, the glory of God is already inside of you if you are born again. If somehow or another you were to lose it and had to replace it, God would have to strip heaven of all of its glory to replace what's on the inside of you. Second Thessalonians chapter two, you have obtained the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. It's already happened. And some of you are listening to me and you think, this doesn't make sense. And you go look in the mirror and you think this is glory. And you see gray hairs and wrinkle and spots and ugly. And you think this is glory. No, it's not your body. It's in heavenly place. It's in the spirit realm. In your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. First John chapter four, verse 17 says, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is speaking of Jesus, so are we. And it didn't say, so are we going to be someday when we get to heaven? When we all get to heaven, what a day that'll be. It says, so are we in this world. In this world, you are identical to Jesus. 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the Greek word for one is hes, H-E-I-S. It means a singular one to the exclusion of another. You're identical. You're the same. In the spirit, you are one with the Lord. As he is, so are you. And again, people go look in the mirror or then they feel their emotions. Is this the way that Jesus is? No, he's not like your physical body. Your physical body has got to be changed. He's not like you think in your mind. Your mind is going to have to be renewed and changed. But in your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. Everything that you will ever need is already there. Do you think that Jesus, if the doctors told him he had a sickness or disease, do you think he would fall apart like a $2 suitcase and cry and go beg and ask God to touch him? Man, how do you think Jesus would respond? Well, in the spirit, you're identical to him. And the only reason you respond differently than Jesus is because you haven't changed your identity yet. You don't know who you are in Christ. You know, I could relate all of this back to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve didn't know what they had. They were told by a talking snake that if you'll eat this tree, this fruit, then you will have more. The truth is they had less. They were already like God and didn't know it. You're already like God. You've already got the power of God. That's the reason that book that I've got entitled, You've Already Got It, has a picture of a dog chasing his tail. You're trying to get something that you've already got. Saying, oh God, heal me. Did you know if God could be confused, I believe God would be confused. I could just imagine God looking over at Jesus and saying, didn't you tell them that by your stripes they were healed? Because people are saying, oh God, heal me. And he's, how how do you respond if somebody's asking you for something that you've already given them? You know, often I'll walk down to the front row and I'll give my Bible to somebody and they have my Bible in their lap. And then I say, now what do I do if this person asks me to give them their, my Bible and they've already got it? How do you respond to somebody who's asking you for something that you've already got? You'd probably just look at them and say nothing. It'd be silence like you'd be trying to figure out what's, what's wrong with this person. Their elevator doesn't go to the top floor. <laughs> I believe that's the reason that sometimes when you pray, it's silent. God's thinking, what do they want me to do that I haven't done? (laughs) See, it goes on to say here in Ephesians chapter one, are you still there? The next verse, he's asking that their eyes would be open in verse 19 to what is the exceeding greatness 
of his power. If you study that out in the Greek, did you know that the words that are used are, it's an, it's an expletive. It is a superlative. It's like, you can't get any better than this. And that word is used twice. It's like, it just doubles it. Like this is the exceeding greatness. It's beyond our comprehension, what God has given us. And he's praying that our eyes would be open to this exceeding greatness of his power toward us or to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might, etc. He's praying that God show them the power that they've got. It's the same power that was used when Jesus was raised from the dead. Man, that, that ought to be enough for your hangnail, your headache, your ingrown toenail. And yet people think, oh God, this is really hard. You're going to have to pull out all of the stops to heal this one. They said it's cancer, it's AIDS, it's this. Man, the power that we've got is so much greater than anything that's coming against us. But the problem is the body of Christ doesn't know what we have. We think that God has to respond to us. And so we, this is how you come up with doctrines that the devils are blocking our prayers. They can't get up to God. And so we've got to get into intercession and we got to create a hole over Los Angeles so that our prayers can get past the demons up to God. And so you get intercessors together. They had a deal where they took 20,000 intercessors that went to Ephesus to fight God, Diana, the goddess of Ephesus, believing that that was the spirit that was behind all of the uh, Arab stuff that's going on. Let me just say, how dumb can you get and still breathe? <laughs> I don't doubt that there's demonic powers, but the way you deal with them isn't by asking God to clear it. You don't need your prayers to get up past the demons. I don't doubt that there's demons over LA, but you don't have to get your prayers past them up to God. You don't need to get your prayers above your nose because God moved on the inside of us. God Almighty's right here. The Bible says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit. The spirit is right here in your belly. Some of you look like you got more of the spirit than others, <laughs> but it's not true. <laughs> Amen. You don't need your prayers to get up past the ceiling or past the demons. You don't need your prayers to get above your nose. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray. To say, Father, amen, <laughs> right, right here. See, if you had this attitude, you would reject the foolishness that's been done in spiritual warfare where people have literally rented planes and flow, uh, flown up high because it says in Ephesians chapter six that we are dealing not with flesh and blood, but with principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And, and there's people that have rent planes to go up and do spiritual warfare. They climb up on mountains. That's just, forgive me for being blunt, but I'm leaving tonight, amen. I'm just, <laughs> you can take it or leave it, but I'm telling you, that is dumb to the second power. That's dumb, dumb. That is just stupid. You have the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus from the dead. It's not out there. You don't have to have God stretch forth his hand and touch you. He's already, you're already touched. You are touched in your head. Amen. That's what the problem is. God's already put this power. And if you were ever seeing that, you know, like you just know that God, I've got your resurrection power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. If you ever got a revelation of that, then whatever the devil throws at you, they say, you're dying. It's terminal. No big deal. It's no big deal. Carly will tell you her daughter, Hannah, when they had told other people about how terrible her situation was and that she was sent home to die, they would, you could just see the fear and the doubt that would come into people. And when they told me that she had this, how do you say it, Carly? Eosinophilic enteropathy. I can't even pronounce it, much less understand it. But when they would tell other people what she had, 
They would just, you know, struggle. And I just said, that's a piece of cake for Jesus because it is. It doesn't matter. You name anything. The Bible says that Jesus' name is exalted above anything else that has a name. If you can put a name on it, if you can pronounce Enos, whatever, <laughs> Jesus is above that. If they can say cancer, if they can say AIDS, if they say ALS, if they say whatever, Jesus is above it. If it's got a name, Jesus, the power on the inside of you is greater than that. And if you would approach your problems from that standpoint, not that, oh God, I know you can heal. You haven't healed. I know you can do anything. You haven't done anything, but you could do anything. See, when you approach him that way, you've already started from a position of unbelief. He says that you already have the same power that raised Christ from the dead, but no, you, I, God, I don't have it. Oh God, I need people come to me. Would you please do something? Because I'm powerless. I have nothing. You've already, you're in a position of unbelief. You've rejected, you've renounced your authority. You aren't standing in who Christ made you to be. And so you're starting from a position of failure and a position of unbelief, trying to obtain victory. Instead, we ought to start from victory. We ought to be seated in heavenly places with Christ. And we ought to look down at our problems and say, cancer, you're nothing. Kidney disease, you are nothing. We ought to look at the devil like, is this the best you could do? Is this your best shot? No big deal. See, it's already done. Just as in the physical creation, it was already done. God has anticipated every need that you'll ever have. If you have a financial need, you don't have to say, oh God, please give me money. It says in Deuteronomy 8, 18, he's already given you power to get wealth. He doesn't give you money directly. He gave you power and anointing. And all you got to do is believe. Believe that you're anointed. Believe that you're blessed. Believe that whatever you set your hand unto will prosper. See, this is the reason I don't like welfare. I'm not against anybody who's on welfare I know that people have problems and you can need help and stuff. I'm not criticizing, but I'm saying don't stay there. This isn't God's system. It's not God's system to let somebody else provide for you. You have the power to get wealth. And he said he would bless what you set your hand unto. If you set your hand to nothing, a hundred times zero is zero. It'd be better for you to go flip burgers at McDonald's. And some of you think, well, I'm making more off welfare than that. But God can't multiply welfare because you aren't doing anything. You'd be better off to go flip burgers at McDonald's or be a greeter at Walmart and do something because God could multiply that and increase that. But he cannot bless you beyond welfare. When you make yourself subject to welfare and commit to that and look to that as your source, you have limited God big time. And the only reason you would do that is because you don't know who you are and what you have. If you knew the power that God had given you to get wealth, I guarantee you, you would do something different. Have any of you ever seen this thing on television where they have this little board that has a bubble on the bottom and there's people standing on it doing like the twist and it's an exercise thing? The lady who came up with that was in our Bible studies in Lamar, Colorado. And she was poor, poor, poor. Jamie and I had to help her and she helped us because we weren't real well off at that time either. But you know what? She got to listening to what I was saying. Her husband was working at a Dairy Queen for his parents and they didn't have enough money. And Kim Clark is her name. She just got to believe in God and saying, God, there's something you've done. Just like I was sharing during the offering about that, you know, Dairy Queen's not our source. God, you've given me power to get wealth. There is something I can do. And she got to praying in tongues and believing God for a creative idea. And one day she was watching her kids play and she was making clay for them because she didn't like the clay that you bought in the stores because it was toxic and kids tend to eat it and she didn't want that. It would stick to the carpet. And so she came up with her own recipe and made a uh, clay that was not toxic. It wouldn't stick to anything but to itself. So she was cooking this clay on the stove and praying in tongues, God, give me a creative idea. And God told her to take that clay and put it, roll it into little 
uh, cylinder type things, put six of them in a baggie and take it to these uh, shows and sell it. And within a short period of time, she had 80 employees and was a multimillionaire making this. And now she's come up with this little thing that you do the twist on. And she made that and she went on Shark Tank. And I may miss some of the details of it, but within one hour of being on Shark Tank, her, she raised over a million dollars in product. And her next check, she's got a new thing coming out. She's going to be on Shark Tank again. And her next check, she said the first check could be as much as $1 billion, her royalty off of it. And you know what? This is somebody who was so poor that they couldn't eat. We had to bring them food. They had nothing going for them, but they knew that God had done something. They started believing that God, you have provided before I have my need. There's an answer to this need. Give me a creative idea how to get it out. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is a different attitude than what the average person has, even the average Christian. The average Christian is approaching God as, oh God, I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing, but you can do all things. And you just throw your prayer out to God. And then you're waiting on God to show up and somehow or another do something. It's a totally different philosophy. It's a totally different way of thinking to see that, man, when you got born again, God created you with the power, the authority, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead so that you can deal with anything that life throws at you. If you get sick, he's already put raising from the dead power on the inside of you. If you're poor, he's already given you the power to get wealth. If you are fighting depression, he's already given you the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. You've already got it. It's not out there somewhere. Did you know that every time you're depressed, that your spirit is just rejoicing and basking in the presence of God? And some of you think, how could that be? If that was so, I would know it. No, you wouldn't. That which is spirit is spirit, and that which is flesh is flesh. The only way you can know what's going on in the spirit realm is to look through the lens of the Word of God. It says in John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus was speaking, and he says, It's the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. God's word is spirit. It is a perfect representation of the spiritual realities. You can't go to a mirror and see God. You can't see your born again spirit. You can go see your face. You can see your hair. You can see how you look. You can search your emotions and tell whether you're encouraged or discouraged, but you can't see your spirit any other way except through the word of God. And you have to just hold this up and how am I? Well, right here in Ephesians 1, 3, I am blessed with all spiritual blessings. And your emotions will say, no, you're sad, you're depressed. I don't care what I feel like. This is who I am in the spirit and I'm going to walk in the spirit instead of in the flesh. And you just start acting on who you are in Christ. We don't understand that God has already equipped you. God... God does not have to heal anybody today. People are saying, oh Lord, please heal me again. By his stripes, you were healed. It's not up to God whether you get healed. God isn't healing people today. He healed people 2,000 years ago through the stripes of Jesus. By his stripes, you were healed. And he hadn't taken any stripes for 2,000 years. Jesus isn't taking stripes. He's not going to heal you today. You've already been healed and he put that miraculous healing power on the inside of you. It is not up to God whether you get healed. It's up to you whether you're going to rest and trust in what God did or if you're going to get out of that and start going by how you feel and what the doctor said and start speaking your unbelief. If you will stay in the rest of God, and just say, Father, I believe you've already provided it. You knew that this problem was coming. It didn't catch you by surprise. And so you just rest in it. Father, it's a done deal. What do you want me to do to release it? How do I release it? What do I say? What do I do? And you just respond to him. You abide in that rest. I wish I had time to turn to Hebrews chapter 4. This is what the whole chapter of Hebrews chapter 4 is talking about. There remains a rest to the people of God. 
And it's talking about entering into a place instead of thinking, oh God, you can turn this situation around. You just say, Father, thank you that you've already turned it around. Before I had the problem, you had already created the supply. Before the need existed, the supply was there. Father, thank you. And I just ask you to show me how to manifest it. See, this is where I'm living right now. God has told me to build this Bible college campus. It is going to be hundreds of millions of dollars. And I don't have it in my flesh, but in my spirit. He, he knew what he was going to ask me to do. And he has already equipped me to do it. And I'm just resting in the Lord and trusting that it's all coming to pass. And I haven't seen the total fulfillment of it. But in four and a half years, we've spent over $65 million cash, not going in debt, because I'm resting in him and God is supernaturally supplying my need. There is nothing going to happen to you that's going to surprise God. And again, see this lack of this attitude is reflected in the way we pray because most people, when you get a bad report, man, you go before the Lord, you spread the doctor's report out and you spend 30 minutes or an hour telling poor misinformed God about how bad your situation is. It's like he's got a million requests on his desk. You got to get yours to the top of the stack. So you spend a lot of time telling God, oh God, this is really bad. God, I need an immediate attention. And see, it's reflected in the way we pray. We think that somehow or another, we got to do something to motivate God to get on our side. Brothers and sisters, he's already on your side. He's anticipated anything you'll ever need. And you've already got on the inside of you, everything you will need. God doesn't have to heal you. God doesn't have to prosper you. God doesn't have to deliver you. He's already done it. All you got to do is step over into faith and rest in it. Rest is how you receive this. And it just flows. Do you know that the Sabbath, it, it says over there in Genesis chapter 2, that he rested on the seventh day and he blessed the seventh day. And this is where the whole concept of the Sabbath comes from. You know what the Sabbath pictured? It pictured that everything was complete, that it was done. People have gotten caught up in the observance of a certain day and they've missed what it stood for. You know what? He, he, told the, he told the Israelites, he says, only work six days and take the seventh day off just to rest. You know, today, most of us were raised with, you know, this concept of only working five days or something like this. But in history, Man, this was unusual, especially long time ago. People worked seven days, sun up to sundown, and they barely squeezed the living out. There was no such thing as taking one out of seven days off. But God's people were commanded to take one out of seven days off. And God blessed them because it was a step of faith. It was to remind them that, look, you're working, you're sowing seed, but it's God who's your source. And to prove it, Take one out of seven days off. And they prospered more than the people who worked seven out of seven days. It was an indication to them that, hey, even though you're working, I'm your source. And then just in case anybody missed that, you can read about this in Leviticus chapter 25. He commanded them to take one year out of every seven off. And they couldn't sow seed during that seventh year. And they couldn't reap what grew of itself they had to totally just take an entire year, one year out of every seven off. And it says in Leviticus chapter 25, it's somewhere around verse 20. It says, if the people say, how are we going to eat in the seventh year? He says, I'll bless you with three times a normal crop on the sixth year. That'll take you through the sixth year, through the seventh year and through the eighth year while you're sowing your seed. In case anybody missed the purpose of the Sabbath, Showing that God is your source. Just rest in Him. He will supernaturally supply. In case you missed the Sabbath day, how could you miss the Sabbath year? That you take an entire year off and yet you just get like clockwork three times a normal harvest. The whole thing was to show that God is my source. And even though I may be over here working, my job's not my source. God is my source. And this is the same point that's behind giving. 
Did you know God could have made it so that he just gave me an unlimited amount of money and I put it in the bank and live off the interest? God could do that. We've got one guy who watches me every single day is what he said. I've never met this man, but I've been in contact with him. He says he watches me every day. He lives in Singapore, and one of my staff went over and met him, and he picked him up in his Bentley Rolls Royce following his other Bentley, or not Rolls Royce, Bentley uh, limousine, following his other Bentley limousine and took him to his mansion that was hundreds of millions of dollars, and he had just bought his... 53rd boat that day for $253 million paid cash. And you know that guy, all he's given us is a box of tea. And it was a nice box of tea. It was expensive tea. He's never given me anything. But I'm saying that this guy is a billionaire. He could have given me billions of dollars, but he didn't. God could have somebody like that just supply my need. Why is it that he set it up that you give and that you have to receive? Because he wants you to depend upon him. He wants you to be a part of this. He could just bless you, but when you work and you go get your paycheck, you don't go up to the ticket window and say, oh, thank you for giving me this money. You're so nice to give me this money. You don't act like it's a gift. You take it like I earned this and more. (laughs) You think this is yours. This is your money. But you know, the truth is God is your source. It's God that caused you to be born at this time, that caused you to live in one of the most prosperous nations that has ever been on the planet. It's God who gave you your health. It's God who gave you your talents. All God would have to do is just stir the chemicals in your brain a little bit and you'd be having drool dripping off your chin. You did not make yourself who you are. God is your source, whether you recognize it or not. So how do you recognize God is your source? He says, give me 10%. Not because he needs it. You need to trust and recognize God is your source. That's the reason he asked for this. Over in the 51st chapter of the book of Psalms, he says, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. And you could even add the hills that the cattle are on. Everything is his. He says, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need this. But you need to recognize your total dependence upon God. And so God says, give me 10%. Why? Because he wants you to see him as your source. A person who says, I can't afford to tithe. What you're saying is, I don't believe God is my source. I believe that if I give, this money will not come back to me. And so I I have to hold on. I've had many people say, I would be glad to give if I had it. What you're saying is, if I can take care of myself and take care of all of my lust and my desires and have anything left over so that when I give, if it doesn't come back to me, then I'll still make it. That's what you're saying whether you know it or not. But when you take what you've got and you need it, you want to get over there and you aren't there yet and you take a portion of what you have and give it away, you're moving away from your goal instead of towards it in the natural. But since there's a God who says, if you will give to me, I will give back unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Then when you give, you aren't moving away from your goal. You're moving towards it. You are taking steps of faith and you will prosper more with just 90% less left than if you had 100%. It's all about faith. That's the reason God wants you to give. That's the reason that God wanted people to take one day a week off is to recognize, God, you're my source. And it's not just lip service with me. I believe it. I'm going to work only six days out of seven. And I trust that you will cause me to prosper. And just like clockwork, he did. And I'm going to take one year out of seven years off and you will cause me to prosper. And you know what it's all about is that God has already done it. God is your source and you have to rest and trust in him. And yet when it comes, see, when it comes to getting born again, the reason people get born again is because they say, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. They look at salvation as an accomplished work. They don't say, Jesus, would you please come and die for me and bear my sins? 
If you thought that, if you thought that you had to pray and then Jesus had to somehow or another respond to your prayer and come and die for your sins, if you looked at it as if it wasn't done, I can guarantee you the vast majority of people in here would have never received salvation. Satan would have talked you out of it and thought, well, maybe God had died for somebody else, but not for you. But it was presented to you as, no, he died 2,000 years ago. It's already done. Your sins have been dealt with. Now, are you going to receive what's already done when it's presented to you that way? Man, amen. You reach out and you receive salvation. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That means if that's the way you receive salvation, as it's a done deal, and all I got to do is believe and receive or doubt and do without, if that's all there is to it, well, then I'm going to believe and receive. That's the reason it was so easy to get saved. But after you're saved, God, the doctor says, I'm sick. Now you've got to get God to heal you. It still has to be done. See, that's wrong. God has already healed you the same as he already died for your sins. He's already blessed you financially the same way that he already died for your sins. Whatever you need has already been accomplished. And the seed form of it is in your spirit. You have that supernatural raising from the dead power on the inside of you. And the rest of the Christian life isn't getting God to do something, but resting in what he's already done. And over in, amen, over in Hebrews chapter four, I believe it's verse 11. It says, let's labor therefore to enter into that rest. You know, to the person that doesn't understand what we're talking about, this sounds contradictory. How do you labor to rest? Well, if you're talking about laying down and doing nothing, you don't labor to do that, but it takes effort to get beyond what you see and feel and go by faith in what God's word says and says, Father, I'm not going to get anxious about this. You've already supplied my need, even if I can't see it. Even if the bill collector's threatening to come and kick me out of my house, I'm trusting in you. It's done. You've already supplied my need. If there's something else I need to do, show me. But if you've done what he's told you to do, you just rest in him and God supernaturally comes through. The doctor tells you you're going to die. And instead of, oh God, please heal me. Father, you knew this was coming. You've already placed inside of me the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I refuse to get into worry or fear about this. It's done. I trust you. I trust you with my life. When you live that way, it is so much better. I'm not trying to get God to do anything. I'm trying to learn what God has already done. I'm trying to recognize the power that he's given me and I have to labor to stay in this position of rest that even though I don't see it with my eyes, even though I don't feel it in my body, I believe with all of my heart, it's a done deal. It's done and I'm not moving off of that. Father, you've already supplied my need. I need over a hundred million dollars in the next few years and you know what? I can't prove to you that I've got it. I can't see it but I I know it's done. I know that God's already given me the power to get wealth. Now he calls us to do different things. God didn't call everybody to do what I'm doing, but God has already done this. You know, we're dealing with a situation right now that may or may not come to pass, but we're uh, possibly going to get this acreage that's next to us, 450 or 336 acres and a building on it. And it's, it's multi-million dollar deal and we're dealing with it. And anyway, We just told them, says, look, here's all we're willing to do. And I told Paul, I said, I'm willing to walk away from it. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not, I'm not got my heart set on anything and saying, oh God, please give me this. I don't care. I'm happy with what I got. I'm not doing this for me. It's like, father, if you want us to have this place, if this is part of your plan, I'll receive it. And it's going to work out. And if it's not, I can walk away from it. I'll be just as happy as I can be. I'm not trying to get God to do anything. And I'm telling you, there is such peace. There is such rest in that. When we bought the place that we're in, this is one of the things that happened. I told the guys, I said, look, if this is what God wants for us, I said, we'll have it. And if he doesn't, We won't have it. And they said, well, there's another person that's already bid on it and you got to make a decision today. And I said, well, then let it go. 
I said, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to do anything. I said, God wants me to have it. I'll have it. It's no big deal. I'm not trying to get God to do something. God's already got a plan for my life. And all I'm doing is listening to what God wants me to do. I follow what he tells me to do. And then it's up to God to pay for it. This isn't something I ask God to do. If you have an Ishmael, you got to feed him. But if you have an Isaac, that came from God. And God will supernaturally take care of Isaac. You just got to make sure that this isn't what you're doing, trying to get God to bless your plans. What does God have for you? And just rest in him and follow him. And anything God births, he'll pay for it. He'll take care of it. You don't have to worry about it. I'll tell you, I've said a mouthful tonight. And I've got this teaching entitled, um, You've Already Got It, that will go into a lot more detail. I just hit some highlights. But I'm encouraging you, you need to get this philosophy. You need to get this paradigm that, Father, you've already supplied everything I'll ever need. There's nothing going to happen that you haven't already dealt with. And I tell you, that is so, that is so peaceful that you don't have to worry. If the phone rings, you don't have to be afraid. Oh, no, what's happening? It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what happens. I've already, God has already given me the grace to be able to handle anything that comes against me. I don't care what happens. I'm going to come out smelling like a rose because Jesus has provided it. He's already given me everything that pertains unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. It's already there. I am not struggling. I'm not striving. I'm resting in the Lord. And I would recommend it. And it takes effort to rest. It takes effort to rest. You're going to have to put some time into the Word. You're going to have to spend time renewing your mind. You're going to have to spend time praying in tongues and seeking the Lord. And it's going to take effort. You can't rest easily. It takes effort to rest in what God has done and not get out of faith. But man, it is well worth the effort. God has already done it. Whatever your need is tonight. Do you know if you need healing tonight, you've already been healed. This same power is on the inside of you. This is the reason that we bring our prayer ministers, our Bible college students and graduates and stuff is I'm trying to take people's attention away from thinking that you've got to get God to do something. And so you've got to come to me, the man of God, and let me wave my hand over you. We're trying to teach you that you have this power. It's in you. It's in these people that are down here praying. It's not the super dupers. Every born again believer has the power that raised Jesus from the dead in you. And you know, I've seen great miracles happen. I've stayed up until three o'clock in the morning praying with people many, many, many times. And I love to do it and I don't mind doing it. And I can get some people healed through the faith and the things that God has taught me. But did you know what? I can't deal with every person in here. There's no way I can pray for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And the good news is I don't have to. My anointing isn't to pray for you and get you healed. My anointing is to teach you what you have so that you can receive. I'm not going to go home with you, but the Holy Spirit goes home with you. And if you would uh, respond to him, you can walk in health from now on. If I'm doing a good job, I'll preach myself out of a job to where you don't have to come to me. Now, I've got job security because there's so few people that know this that (laughs) I believe I'll I'll have job security the rest of my life. But I'm praying that you get hold of the Word of God so that you don't need me anymore. (laughs) Amen? You're loaded. You're full. You're full of it. (laughs) Not what you may be thinking of, but you are full of the power of God. You are full of the wisdom of God. Everything that you could ever desire in heaven, you're already that in your spirit. Your spirit's as perfect and complete right now as it'll be a million years from now in heaven. Your spirit's not going to be changed. What will be changed is your physical body and your mind will be renewed and you'll know all things. But to the degree that you can renew your mind and then act on it, you can experience 
heaven right here on this earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The only thing that's stopping heaven from being manifest in your life is your stinking thinking. You get your mind renewed and start thinking according to the word of God. And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And you will experience it. You've already got everything. Get this philosophy, this paradigm that father, everything I need is in here. You know, when Jamie and I first got turned on to the Lord, we had never heard of Copenhagen, <laughs> Copeland and Hagen. I didn't know about them. I'd never heard about healing. Did you know when we first started believing in healing, I didn't know that a person had been healed in 2000 years. I was told that it ended with the apostles and I didn't know that anybody had been healed in the last 2000 years. But I started reading the Bible. And I found out that the works that he did, I will do also. I'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And I just started believing. And when I saw my first person healed, I thought this is the first person that's been healed in 2000 years. <laughs> I didn't know anybody else had been healed. And Jamie and I didn't know anything. We hadn't heard these faith people yet. We didn't know about any of this stuff. But you know, an old blind squirrel will get a nut every once in a while if he doesn't quit. <laughs> I just started praying for everything that moved and I didn't know much. We started seeing blind eyes open, deaf ears open. We saw people raised from the dead and didn't even know what we were doing, but we were just so excited. I knew it was in here somewhere. I didn't know where it was. I didn't know how to get it out, but I quit saying, oh God, would you please do it? And I started saying, Father, you gave me this power. I lay my hands on the sick and they shall recover. And when I started believing that God, it's a done deal. It's not up to you whether these people get healed. It's up to me and that person to believe and activate. And when I started thinking like that, I started seeing things happen. Amen. I would encourage you that, man, you need to get this mindset. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, he says, you heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. You do it. Most Christians are saying, oh God, I can't do anything. I am nothing. I have nothing. Would you? You've already lost. He told you to do it. You've got his power. You are the mobile office of Jesus. You are his mobile office and people don't need to go to heaven that you're there. And you need to start releasing his power. The third chapter of the book of Acts, Peter and John said, such as I have give I unto you. And they didn't even pray a prayer. They didn't say, oh God, would you stretch forth your hand and heal this cripple? No, they just said, such as I have give I unto you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they reached down and grabbed the man by the hand and jerked him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. They didn't even ask God to heal. They said, such as I have. Did you know that would get them kicked out of nearly any Christian church in the world saying that you have it? But you do. You've got it. It's not you. It's not your power. I by myself, I can't heal a gnat. But I've got God's power on the inside of me. And you've got to recognize that you by yourself can do nothing. But you're never by yourself. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so don't sit here and focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have. That man, you are in him and he's in you and you have his power. You know, a good friend of mine, Dave Duell, of course, Dan and Nancy knew him well, many others here. But Dave Duell went to um, Africa and held a meeting many, many years ago. And he saw blind eyes open, deaf ears open. It was awesome. And thousands of people were there. And then the next day he was walking in a market. And of course, he was a white face in a sea of black faces over in Africa. And so he stood out and people recognized him from the crusade and people started running up and wanting to touch him. And Dave, he, he said his first thought was, it's not me, it's not me, it's Jesus. But before he could do that, the Lord spoke to him and he said, Dave. What would you have thought when I rode into Jerusalem on that donkey and people cut down palm branches and threw their garments in the way and they were saying, Hosanna, glory to God. What would you have thought if the donkey said, it's not me, it's not me. 
He says, they aren't praising the donkey. They're praising the one who's riding on him. They aren't praising you. They're looking for the God that's in you. And he said, he just started walking through and letting them touch him. He just held, he just let people come up and touch him. Most people are too religious to do that. But I'm telling you, there's a balance here. It's not you, but it's the one who's riding inside of you. You are just the whatever, fill in the blanks. Amen. It's not you that they're looking at. People come up to me and they say, oh, thank you for saving me. I didn't save anybody. But I tell people the truth and the truth makes them free. I understand what they're saying. But you know, I've seen people before that when they say, oh, thank you for healing me or whatever, they'll go, it's not me, it's not me. Nobody thought it was you except you. (laughs) They just aren't far enough long to phrase it right, but they were praising the God in you. You know what it is? It's humility. Instead of going, it's not me, it's not me. Instead of just say, well, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. That's humility. But we got so much religious stuff that has messed us up. Man, you are loaded. You are the power of God. You need to get a superiority attitude. Amen. I got to quit. I'm not through. I'm just going to quit. And I encourage you to please get all the materials out there because they will explain this in a lot more detail. Father, we thank you that you have supplied everything just like you did for Adam and Eve before they were even created. You had anticipated every need that not only they would have, but all of their children, the entire human race. Thank you that you have provided a perfect world that can handle anything that goes on. And Father, likewise, thank you that you've provided everything for us in the spiritual realm, that it's a done deal that we are complete in you, Colossians chapter two, verse nine. Thank you, Jesus, that we are complete, that we've got everything, that you've already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for that. And I ask that the Holy Spirit just make this real to people here tonight. Well, the Lord is speaking to me that many of you tonight got something. You understood something. And right now you recognize that you aren't trying to get God to heal you, that you've already been healed, that this power is on the inside of you. And all you've got to do is release it. The Bible says, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. The way you release it is with your words. And he said, speak to your mountain. Don't talk to God about your mountain. Talk to your mountain about God. Speak to your problem. Speak to your bones. Speak to your blood. Speak to whatever's hurting you. Right now, I want those of you that your faith has been quickened. I want to qualify this. There's some of you that even though I I love you, you don't believe what I'm saying tonight. It's not a revelation to you, but there's some of you that you got this. Some of you, this is a revelation. And for those of you who God has spoken to you, you need to do something. You need to act on this. Faith without works is dead. And if your faith has been quickened and if you understand what I'm talking about and you're ready to act on it, I want you to stand up right where you are. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer and we're going to start speaking and releasing this supernatural power of God that indwells you. And we aren't going to passively wait on God to touch you anymore. We're going to believe that God did his part and we're going to go to releasing our faith and commanding this power of God that's on the inside of us to manifest. And it could be something besides physical. It could be emotional. It could be spiritual. It could be financial. But if you're ready to release this power and quit begging God for what he's already done and instead start becoming a commander and releasing by your faith what God has already done. And I want you to stand and we're gonna pray. The scripture says that death and life are in the power of your tongue. You can curse your sickness, you can curse your problem and you can release life for the power of God. Father, thank you for all of these people here who say that they've received revelation. They believe it's done. Father, we start by entering in your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. Thank you that you've already done it. Father, thank you that before we ever had a problem, you had already supplied the need. 
Thank you, Father, that you've anticipated. Thank you that there is no sickness, there's no disease, there's no problem, there's no financial problem. There's no hurt or pain that you haven't already dealt with and put within us your supernatural power in life. We just thank you, Father, for the knowledge that it's there. If we never saw it manifest, what a great comfort to know that you've done your part and that it's in us. We praise you. And Father, we repent and ask your forgiveness for limiting you and not knowing what we have for falling prey to the lies of the devil and us just moaning and complaining about what our problem is instead of seeing what you've done. And we thank you that you're faithful and just to forgive us. So we just receive it. And right now, Father, we step into that place of faith. We step into the rest, believing that you've already done it, that you've already created it, that it's a done deal. Father, thank you that people have already been healed, that we have on the inside of us the healing power that it takes to overcome that sickness and disease. And so right now, sickness and disease, we speak directly to you and we curse you. We curse all kinds of infirmities, all kinds of infections, all kinds of diseases, tumors. We curse you, Satan. We command you to get out of our lives. We speak that you do not have the right to over, overrule us, to dominate us. We command you to leave right now in the name of Jesus. Loose us. Get out of this place. Get out of our bodies. Leave now in the name of the Lord Jesus. We resist you. And if we resist,